chest back there for, for where we keep our offering uh, for our treasures are stored in heaven and not uh, stored here. And so if you feel like giving by, by donating, uh, our treasure chest is in the back there. We're glad everybody's here today. Why don't you take a few minutes and, and greet somebody you haven't said hello to this morning. Good to hear your fellowship. It really is. Good to hear your fellowship. We have a special announcement to make. Um, you can remain standing. That's okay. Scott, where are you? Scott Andrews. Scott, back here in the corner. Y'all turn around and see Scott. Scott is is wanting us to know that, that uh, he wants to be obedient to the Lord's call and be faithful to follow his example in baptism. Scott was raised in a slightly different uh, faith tradition where he was baptized as, as a very young child. And he wants to come now and, and be faithful in believers' baptism. And Scott, we rejoice with you, and we're looking forward to that baptism service. And we want to encourage all of you to speak with Scott, encourage him. And Murphy, are you standing right there beside Dad? <laughs> Murphy came to me and talked this week, and Murphy uh, has accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she wants to be faithful and uh, follow the example of, of the Lord in, in baptism as well. And so we're going to have a pretty special baptism service in March where we have father and daughter in the water together. And that's going to be awesome. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's applause time. <laughs> so y'all take an opportunity to see where they are at the end of the service. Go back and greet them. Give them a hug. Encourage them uh, as they continue their walk with the Lord. So we're excited, gang. Looking forward to it.
think is a good lead into the next song we're going to do. The Lord is with us always, and he, he fills us with his spirit. And when we come to this place, it's, it's like being refilled, refueled for the, for the week to come. And oftentimes we say we're refueled, and then we hold that fuel inside instead of sharing it with the world around us and um, exploding with that joy. Um, Jeff and I, uh, along with the youth and about 20,000 other people, were at uh, Winter Jam last night. Um, raise your hand if you were there last night. Oh, look, the youth who went last night are here, <laughs> even though they were out late. That is good. Um, was that a good concert? I enjoyed it. Um, but it was a, it, Winter Jam is, a, is when... There's about 10 bands, and they get together, and we all, get, and everybody comes together. It's only $10 at the door, and everybody gets to come in and worship together as one big family. Uh, and the last band that played last night is a band called Skillet. If you don't know who Skillet is, you should all experience Skillet at least once in a while. Skillet is a, is a hard rock band, but they do it for Jesus. And um, that, it is easy to see in, the, in that band, the fire of God that's, that's in them and, and the way they are consumed with the joy, the fire of God to, to share it with the world around them. And this next song is about that consuming fire. Won't you stand with us as we worship?
consume, the consuming fire, Father, that you would ignite us with a passion to go out to the people we see every day, to pray wherever we are, to seek you wherever we are, at school, in the coffee shop, in the, um, at work, just like in the video, wherever we go. Father, help us to see you. Help us to be filled with who you are and what you would have for us to do. And Father, let us not be so carried away with the things we have to do in this world. But Father, let the things we do in this world be reflective of what you've called us to do, no matter where we are, no matter what we do. Thank you for that fire, and we ask that you would keep it strong in our hearts. Amen.
noticed that. I was sitting there going, wow, we had flames on the screen. And, and, and like two minutes later, there was rain falling. I thought, that does, we're not seeing a subliminal message that you're supposed to quench the spirit. That's not at all what we're saying. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank Mary. You, you'll notice this morning, Bonnie was gone. Our keyboard player is sick. So if you would please pray for her and her, her little girl, Katie. They, they're sick. And so she's not able to be here. And we didn't know this until late last night. So I called Mary and said, Mary, hey, how, how do you feel about keyboard? <laughs> hey, you know, how about that? So she stepped in, and Jeff's going to step in in just a few minutes and do something he didn't know he was going to do when he came this morning. So, you know, it, it's always, uh, hey, this is, a, this is a drilling rush. I mean, it really is to play in this group. So um, last week, we talked a lot about wherever Jesus went, miracles happened. I mean, just, just broke out. Miracles just happened all the time. And, and I would have loved, I mean, I was born 2,000 years too late. Because I would have loved to have been in that kind of environment. I think that that would have been something, just to see God's, God's power poured out, I think would just have been incredible. And you say, well, Raymond, why can't that happen today? See, it can. And that's what we talked about last week. And we're, and we're going to kind of stay in that same vein today because we're going to talk about the fact, not, not only did miracles happen, but more specifically, healing took place. Because wherever Jesus was, wherever God was, life came to life. You know, and, and that's really cool. And, and I want to read a, a, a passage for you. It's from Mark chapter 1, and it kind of picks up where we left off last week. Uh, it begins in verse 29, and the little subtitle in your Bible says, Jesus heals many. So you kind of know what's coming, right? <laughs> 20, verse 29 says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they took Jesus and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on him. Not wait as in, hey, when are we leaving? But wait as in, serve me. Interesting. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left that house, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, <laughs> Where you been? That's a Luke translation. <laughs> Everyone is looking for you, Master. I mean, that, where have you been? Jesus, where have you been? Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Life comes to life. When Jesus is around. In the presence of God, life comes to life. Just think back through scripture, numerous examples. Elijah, breathing life into a dead boy's body. Where did that power come from? In God. Isaiah telling us that to wait upon the Lord for the renewal of our strength. Paul doing whatever it took to let people understand that, that life is in Jesus Christ. Jesus healing the sick, casting out demons. You know, restoring the broken people. Again and again, the message is the same. Wherever God is, wherever Jesus is, life comes to life. Things are going to be all right. You notice in this passage, Mark writes that, that at evening time, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And, 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 they, and he cured many of those who, it says, various diseases. Use your imagination. It could have been anything. And I thought to myself, what a blessing it must have been to see that happen, to be the beneficiary of new life, new life in Christ. And, and, and the life-giving blessing of Jesus' touch, though, it's not just limited to those people. I said I was born 2,000 years too, too late, but it, it's not limited to those who walk and talk with Jesus in the flesh. It really isn't. You know, we don't have to celebrate from afar. We can look within. And we can look at our own lives because we, too, have joined the ranks of those who have been given, given new life in Jesus Christ, right? That's why we come together this morning, amen, to celebrate the 
the life that we have in Jesus Christ. Because this newness of life, it may or may not have come in physical restoration in your particular case, but certainly for all of us, we know what it means to be restored spiritually, right? We know what that feels like. We know that. And, and, and we need to understand that, that it's not just life that's given to us, but we need to be conduit. As, as Jeremy made reference to, you know, when, when we are filled up and we are given life, we need to be conduits of new life to other people, kind of individual pipelines, if you will, to let God's love, you know, and his, his life-giving spirit flow through us to other people. The Apostle Paul got that. He understood that. You know, being a, an ex-Pharisee, he understood that the law killed and, and, and Christ, freedom in Christ, gave life. And, and, and we should follow that kind of example. Understand really what's at stake here. And, and that's why the Apostle Paul became, as he puts it, all things to all people so that he could offer to others what was offered to him. Newness. New life in Jesus Christ. And, and I think, you know, as we read this, what's our takeaway? Our takeaway is we need to follow that example. We need to follow the example of, of Jesus. We need to follow the example of the Apostle Paul and others who've walked in that tradition of letting God's love, letting life-giving spirit flow through them to other people. I, I think Jesus kind of put it out there for us. Um, he said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And you take that, and you also consider that in one of his last parables, that the one of the sheep and the goats, which we, you know, preachers like to hold over your head, <laughs> or you know, sheep or a goat. But, you know, in, in that parable, really the point of what Jesus was trying to make is, you know, God's reward is to those who feed the hungry. God's reward is to those who give drink to the thirsty. God's reward is to those who welcome the stranger, who, who clothe the naked, who care for the sick, who visit the imprisoned. And I'll be honest with you, College Park has a strong tradition of doing those things. We really do. We have volunteers that, that work in all sorts of agencies, not just within the immediate life of the church, but within the community that do all of those things, that feed the hungry, that, get, that give drink to the thirsty, that welcome strangers, that clothe the naked, that care for the sick, that go and visit the imprisoned. That's what Jesus says we are to be about to give life as it's given to us, we extend that love to other people. And we can convey life to others in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit. Warning. Warning. I should have those things flashed up here. Warning. What we have to keep in mind, and, and it's crucial for us to do so, is that we can be effective only insofar as we ourselves remain connected to the source of life, and that is God. Can I get an amen? amen. We can only be effective in so much as we are plugged in and connected to God. Notice what Jesus did. Jesus had just been pouring out himself. He's been healing. He's been casting out demons. He has been giving life. And where does he go? He didn't go out to city square and say, yeah, how great am I? He knew where his power came from, where his strength came from, and to whose glory it should be extended. And, and it's very clear. After he poured himself out, Mark tells us that he retreated. He retreated to a solitary place so that he could be alone with God in prayer. our soul, through our spirit, then we need to stay connected with God. And, it, and it's interesting, Jesus felt the need to do this. He knew that was critical, but somehow we think we don't have to. <laughs> do, do you see the arrogance there? God, no, I just didn't have time to talk to you today. I didn't have time to pray today. I'll get to you tomorrow or the next day. Are you kidding me? That what that tells me is, God, I'm not going to work for you today, so therefore I don't need to heal. I'm not going to expend anything on your behalf, on behalf of the kingdom today, so therefore I don't need to be charged, because I haven't really exerted anything. That's 
get into this trap of, you know, as long as we're doing ministry, we feel like we're doing God's work, and, and he'll understand if we don't spend our time in prayer and Bible study. Even more critical, when you're doing, when you're pouring yourself out deeply, you need that time. You need the time to recharge, to allow God to, to recharge who you are and whose you are. Great story. One of the, the great missionaries of the 20th century was a lady named Mary Reed. She was a young woman who was determined that she was going to help bring life to the women of India. If you know anything about the culture of India, you, you understand what her sentiment was. And, and for eight years, she worked under incredibly difficult conditions in Kampur, India, until finally her health began to collapse. And, and those that cared about her sent her away to the Himalayas. They said, go over there, recuperate. And, and while she was there, she discovered this colony of 500-plus lepers that were living there without help or support. I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of a throwback to kind of New Testament days. And, and, and she felt compassion for those people. And sometime later, after her health began to be restored, she returned back to India, but within a year, her health declined sharply again, so those that cared about her again sent her home. They sent her back to America. They said, you really need to go back and just kind of physically recharge. And while she was uh, back in America, much to her dismay and the, and the confusion of the doctors, her health continued to decline. And she realized finally what was happening. Pain in her fingers, there was a spot on her face, the telltale signs that she had contracted Hansen's disease, which is a nice name for leprosy. She had caught leprosy from those that she was ministering to who were lepers. Now, if you think about her situation, wouldn't it be understandable if she said, God, I tried to serve you, and this is how you rewarded me. Because of her efforts in Chandak, India, there is a settlement, there is a hospital for lepers that grew out of her efforts. One person, one person had a huge impact on people. A servant of the Lord whose, whose life was filled to the brim, if you will, with the Holy Spirit and just wanted to pour it out. And, and in doing so, she brought life to those who had experienced this tragedy before. Unbelievable story. One of my favorite stories is the story of a teacher who was teaching second graders at Vacation Bible School. And as he was teaching the children about being the hands and feet of Christ in the world, he, the, the, the setup question was then, so where is Jesus now? And the kids all said, in my heart. Jesus lives in me. They had been raised in Sunday school. They knew the church answered prayer. Jesus lives in me. But one kid who hadn't been raised in church raised his hand. He's looking at the picture of Jesus. He goes, but Jesus is really big and I'm really small. If Jesus lives in me, shouldn't he stick out somewhere? <laughs> Pretty good theology, if you think about it. If Jesus lives in Others should be able to see him sticking out to me. <laughs> I'm a mouth of man. <laughs> Wherever Jesus is, healing takes place. It may not be in the form that we think. It may not be in the fashion that we desire selfishly. But wherever Jesus is, healing takes place. Things are going to be all right. When we give him control, things are going to be okay. Miraculous things happen. Healing happens. Life comes to life in the presence of God. My prayer for us is that we would not only be the beneficiaries of life, but that we would be the instruments as well. Amen? Let's pray and ask for each other. Dear
Dear God, we confess that too many times we think that we can do it on our own. We come here and, and we worship together. And we get recharged in a sense. We, we kind of get on a high, spiritually speaking. And so we take off into Monday. The world kind of beats us around a little bit. And we think, well, Tuesday will be better. Beat around a little bit. And, and God, we just we confess that to you that, that sometimes we do it on our own. And so we have two prayers this morning, Father. Number one, that you would make yourself so real to us that there would be no denying what you want us to do as your children, as your hands and feet. And number two, that we would surrender ourselves to your spirit. That we would stay connected. Listen to you as you direct our steps, as you direct our hands. God, we pray that our heart would be so in tune with you that we would not miss some, some gentle nudges that you give us toward ministry. God, we pray that we would surrender all that we have, all that we are, for your glory. I want to ask you if you would stand. We're going to sing uh, a song with, with Jeremy and Jimmy and Jess and Mary. Uh, it's a song I think you'll probably recognize. We're just going to kind of do it acoustic um, as, as a time of reflection, uh, as a time of acknowledgement of who God is. So I invite you to stand with me and sing. Oh,
God, we are thankful that you are in this place with us. And Lord, we are thankful that when we walk out these doors this morning, you will still be with us. Lord, we thank you for the life-giving, abundant, joyful life that you desire to give us each day. Lord, I pray that in coming days, Lord, that your spirit would seek us out in those times when we want to forget that you're with us. Lord, that you would attune our hearts to see you at work in the world around us. That you would help us to hear your voice as you call us day after day, moment after moment, to live with you living through us. Lord, we thank you for the life that you've given us. Lord, help us as we leave now to go out and to share that life and that joy with others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 